Welcome. This is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And this is James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com, and we both heartily welcome you to the 100th episode of New World Next Week. No fanfare, no guest stars, no clip shows. We're just going to do what we've always done for you for the past two plus years, and that's give you the breakdown on some of the most important stories in alternative news and open source intelligence. And James, we will begin this 100th episode with an article hot off the presses that you just posted to FukushimaUpdate.com. Who knew what when? The Fukushima saga continues. Hot on the heels of news that the Japanese government somehow lost its records of its early meetings on the Fukushima disaster, comes a leak of a document we previously reported on that outlined a worst-case scenario for the nuclear meltdown that included the evacuation of Tokyo. The leaked report was obtained by the Associated Press earlier this week and details the recommendations of a team of nuclear experts who concluded, quote, we cannot rule out further developments that may lead to an unpredictable situation, end quote, and urged the government to prepare for the need to evacuate as many as 35 million people from a region that included Tokyo and its suburbs. Last year, then, Japanese Prime Minister Khan was quoted as saying that the report represented, quote, a crucial moment when I wasn't sure whether Japan could continue to function as a state, end quote. Ultimately, he rejected the plan outright and publicly proclaimed that there was no need to prepare for evacuation because it would cause too much chaos. Now, James, I'm going to throw this back to you to expand on this leak, but I'll ask you one quick question. I haven't been able to find a copy of this leak. I, I checked Scribd, and I even checked some of the file sharing sites. Is it Has the leaked document leaked to the public? I haven't seen it yet. Um, I, this literally is right off, uh, hot off the press, so I haven't, I haven't been able to find a copy yet. But when, I, it, when and if I do, of course, I'll post it up to Fukushima Update um, so that you can actually read the original report itself. But of course, it would be in Japanese anyway, so who knows if people would be able to read that. But, um, but at any rate, uh, it, it is extremely interesting that this report came out and that uh, and it's getting some attention, which is good, but it's kind of old news to people who have been following uh, Fukushima for any length of time. And uh, as I mentioned in that report, uh, we, I did a video of, for GRTV last year about, uh, about that, um, that plan, which hadn't been leaked to the press at that point, but had been talked about by the former Prime Minister Naoto Khan. But, uh, but I thought it was interesting that this came out just as a different story was breaking about a nuclear task force, uh, top-level government um, officials and, and nuclear experts who had been meeting uh, ever since uh, the, the crisis happened, and from what I understand, has, has met 25 times since the, the crisis began. And uh, apparently the NHK, the uh, national broadcaster here in Japan, was requesting documents under kind of the Japanese FOIA laws um, to, to get access to the, the actual meeting minutes and what actually took place in those meetings. And they were able to obtain table of contents and sort of general information about some of the meetings from uh, 3.12 on, but there was a meeting on 3.11 and uh, there's absolutely nothing from that. And the trade minister, Yukio Edano, came out earlier this week and said, oh, sorry about that. It's, it's truly regrettable, but ooh, it looks like we didn't keep any of those meeting minutes. Um, so now uh, that's uh, highly suspicious in and of itself. And again, this is hot off the press and I haven't had time to, to, to dig down or, or to follow this up yet. And uh, so, so look for updates as this develops. But as of this moment, uh, the NHK site has taken down their original story about not having this, uh, this report. I don't know why that's inaccessible at this moment. I just thought that was interesting. It's uh, been preserved at least in part on enenews.com, which again is an extremely valuable resource that I hope people are checking on a daily basis for all of the latest on Fukushima. But uh, I thought it was interesting that that's been scrubbed for some reason, although you can find basically the same information from, um, from other sources, uh, AP and Reuters and stuff have, have stories up on this right now. But, uh, but yes, it's just another case as if we needed more of the government saying, oh, sorry about that, we, that information, oh, it's just gone, it's just lost to the ether. So, so it shouldn't come as any surprise, but it's just more ammunition for those who needed uh, to, to show that this has been, the entire disaster has been a cover up from start to finish, and it continues to be as the government is basically saying the dog ate their homework. We will provide more links and documentation in the show notes for this episode, even a related story, James, that you also have on Fukushima update about radioactive raindrops in Canada. 
Now, as we move to our second story, James, I was going to mention at the top of this episode that we're actually, it's great that this is our 100th episode because we're coming off, I believe, last week's episode was our most watched episode. Am, am I right? Uh, it's up there anyway, yeah. I, I believe so, and I think sometimes that happens when we, we sort of strike while the iron's hot or, or ride the lightning, if you will. But here now in the States, as I come to you January 25th, 2012, on a Wednesday, the biggest story going all around the news. Nine dead, hostages saved, SEAL Team 6 does it again. This is the most recent report I can find. James and I both scouring around. This comes from the Sydney Morning Herald from probably only about an hour ago. First, they took out Osama bin Laden. Now, the U.S. Navy SEALs have earned their Special Forces designation once again by conducting a daring pinpoint rescue of two aid workers held hostage for three months in Somalia. U.S. officials confirmed it was a Navy SEAL team that carried out the pre-dawn raid, but the Pentagon, citing operation security reasons, would not confirm U.S. media reports that it was SEAL Team 6, the same unit which got al-Qaeda leader bin Laden deep inside Pakistan last May 1st. American Jessica Buchanan and Dane Paul Thisted, who both worked for the Danish Refugee Council demining group, were rescued unharmed after helicopter-borne U.S. commandos landed in scrubland in central Somalia early Wednesday local time, according to a local Somali official. They killed all nine of them, the military said. U.S. Defense Secretary Leon Panetta said no U.S. troops had been wounded or killed in the operation, which was personally authorized by President Barack Obama, who would, coincidentally enough, James, last night give a big speech in which, towards the end, he said, if I may quote the teleprompter-in-chief, you know, one of my proudest possessions is the flag that the SEAL team took with them on the mission to get bin Laden. On it are each of their names. Some may be Democrats, some may be Republicans, but that doesn't matter. Just like it didn't matter that day in the Situation Room when I sat next to Bob's, Bob Gates, a man who was George Bush's defense secretary, and Hillary Clinton, a woman who get, ran against me for president, end quote. In a photo op we ultimately learned was not real, just as all the other elements of the bin Laden fairy tale we were told and spoon-fed were not real. And the same type of thing, James, I, I kind of see happening right now. If you go to Twitter and just do SEAL Team 6 search, you will see the same sort of rabble-rousing bandwagon jumping that you saw, you know, those, those kind of spontaneous crowds on May Day last year when they wrote bin Laden out of the script. It's that same kind of bloodlust, and it's fascinating to watch, you know, fake progressives loving murder and mayhem when it's done by other fake progressives. James? And that's really the point of this story, isn't it? It's, it's really just a big sort of PR piece for the military and, oh, rah, rah, America, and look what we can do. I mean, look, I'm not, I don't have any doubt that this, this uh, rescue happened or that, that it, it was, uh, you know, some, some great, extremely well-planned operation or whatever. But uh, the fact that they're bringing in SEAL Team 6 into this smack, smacks me as being just sort of a PR front for, for what's going on. Because uh, I think anyone who knows anything about the special forces and how they work know that basically if you know about the existence of this special elite crack squad, they're not the elite of the elite. The elite are always the, the ones that you've never heard of before and probably will never, you know, they'll never have be touted in the media because uh, they're, they're the ones that really do the undercover operations. So, for example, we saw earlier, I think earlier this week or last week, um, there was the interesting BBC report that came out that admitted, oh, by the way, the British Special Forces were on the ground in Libya helping out with operations there on the ground. Uh, we, we didn't want to tell you at the time, but but now we can. And, uh, and that was a particularly funny story for those who were following it because you might remember last year that uh, this crack squad of the special elite British uh, uh, military forces actually got captured in Libya and had and they, they had to get uh, a special pleading with the uh, the transitional government oh please let our special crack squad team go so so these types of operations take place all the time but when they get pumped in through the media like this it's clearly a PR organization operation that's meant to get into people's head and and to once again get everyone to rally around the flag and go woo woo, go go team America, and that's that's pretty much what this is. It's it's really exactly what it is, and again, I, I feel like it really it kind of shows the the compromise that you know that again the two fake political paradigms that are shoved down all our throats 
to get, you know, that's that's the trick is to get you to act as bad as that thing you claim to despise. And that's the game. So our third and final story this week, James, a headline that caught my eye. Subculture of Americans prepares for civilization's collapse. I have this posted to MediaMonarchy.com, and it comes from the Rothschild controlled Reuters news agency where they write about and they begin the story in where near where I'm from in the Appalachian Mountains. They're talking southwestern Virginia about a growing subculture of Americans who refer to themselves informally as preppers. Some are driven by a fear of imminent societal collapse. Others are worried about terrorism. And many have a vague concern that an escalating series of natural disasters is leading to some type of environmental cataclysm. They are following in the footsteps of the hippies in the 60s who set up communes to separate themselves from what they saw as a materialistic society and the survivalists in the 1990s who were hoping to escape the dictates of what they perceived as an increasingly secular and oppressive government. Preppers, though, are worried about no government. They go on to talk to Kathy Gutierrez, who is an expert on end times belief, beliefs at Sweetbriar College in Virginia. However, they also go on to talk to an attorney in Idaho named Michael T. Snyder, and he runs the Economic Collapse blog. James, I, I found this fascinating as, again, the prepper idea, and it's, I mean, it's more than a meme, it is an actionable reality. But when we see it out there and we see it kind of discussed and, and, and somewhat, you know, derisively. Exactly. I mean, this is the point at which the media comes in and tries to frame this as if it's some sort of, you know, kook fringe movement. And so, of course, they have to find the, the right term for it, you know, give it the ERS ending like truther, birther, tenther. Uh, mm -hmm. prepper you know it's all part of that that whole uh, let's let's take this whole movement this whole idea and let's let's try to frame it in this one story so that the uh, zombies out there who only ever read the headline in the first couple paragraphs of any story can be can find something else to be afraid about oh these these fringe people are, are preparing for to, to get to get off the government grid oh how strange when of course you and I and, and all of the people watching here know that that the only true freedom could could ever possibly come when we start taking uh, taking action to to make sure that we do have communities that can function without the need for, for sucking on the government's tit, to put it <laughs> rather, rather bluntly, and for, for so many reasons, but one of the reasons, of course, in the book like this, Seeds of Destruction by William Engdahl, going over the, uh, the, the crap that they're putting into our food supply and the way they're trying to control that, and all of the other things that we know and we go over on a weekly basis here on New World Next Week are all of the reasons why people have to get independent in every way they can, which includes food, which includes even our, the, what currency we're using, all sorts of different ways for getting off the grid. And that's a, uh, something that more and more and more people are doing. And because they can no longer ignore it, they have to try to frame it in these types of stories and put it in, as you say, derisive terms. So, um, so this is uh, to be expected, but I think that people are smarter than this, and that's exactly why they're tuning out of the mainstream media in droves, and more people are getting their news from alternative news websites like this now than they are from the uh, corporate horror media. So we're winning, they're losing, and uh, they're going to try to try to frame it however they want, but no one's listening, so too bad for them. I will provide a flashback link. I, as I was digging through my archives on Media Monarchy, I knew I had kind of covered this story before. Of course, I mean, it's, it, like I said, it's out there. I had a video on YouTube.com slash Media Monarchy back the last weekend of October 2008, which, of course, is well-timed as it was leading up to the Obama Sia selection, and it's called In Hard Times, Some Flirt with Survivalism. So we will provide that and all the other links and sources and documentation for folks in the show notes so they can go do their own research. And again, NewWorldNextWeek.com gives you the links to high-quality, low-quality, audio-only downloads to be able to spread the word about this and all the other information. So James, thank you so much. Well, thank everyone out there for all their support that made these first hundred uh, episodes of New World Next Week possible, and here's to 10,000 more. Absolutely. Thanks.